Hey guys, I am Pixel Dan. Thank you once again for joining me on my channel for another interview. I'm pretty excited to talk to today's guest. I've actually had the honor of hanging out with him at various conventions over the years. And obviously, like a lot of you, I grew up hearing this voice on the television from things <laughs> such as Thundercats all the way to TV commercials like Cocoa Puffs and Skittles. So I'd like to welcome voice actor Larry Kenny. How's it going, Larry? Hey, PD, how you doing? That's what I call him, folks, PD, for short. You know. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> but not for long. Uh, I'm good, man. I'm good. And you? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. And we were just kind of chatting right before this. Uh, yeah. Man, I miss conventions, right? How about you? Yeah, me too, man. I tell you, I miss miss seeing the fans, you know, and, and the other participants like you. And, uh, you know, you make a lot of friends on these things, both on this side and that side of the tables, right? I mean, you get to meet all the fans. And, and uh, I, I've always liked the fact that I can, I've, I can meet people in the business that I've never met before, too. You know, some of whom are kind of, you know, idols of mine. So um, it, it's they're a lot of fun, yeah. Yeah. And you are, uh, we just found out earlier that, I just found out that uh, I grew up about, uh, what, 90 miles away from where you are right now? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're both yeah. Uh, both Illinois boys, right? <laughs> yeah, it may not be that far. Springfield yeah, Springfield is probably about 90 miles. I grew up in uh, Pekin, Illinois, which is yeah. across the river from um, Peoria. Yeah. Who knows where that is? <laughs> I know where it is because it's not too far from me, but yeah. <laughs> I know where Springfield is. As a matter of fact, we just go to the state fair every year. Oh, yeah. Love the state fair, man. Corn dogs and lemon shakeups. Oh, man. Yeah. And those little fried donuts <laughs> and just, yeah, yeah good stuff. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So yeah, I thought we would have just a, a little chat kind of talking about, you know, your voice acting career and <laughs> Thundercats is obviously just as relevant now as ever. So we can talk about, you know, your work on Thundercats, which I know with my generation, that's one of the things you're, you're most known for, of course, the, yeah. the lion -O. Yeah. Um, so with the voice acting thing, why don't we kind of go ahead and just kind of start with that? Like what, what got you in to the, to the job of being a voice actor how did that all start well uh i started my career in in radio as a disc jockey in peoria illinois back in awesome. uh, <clears throat> 1963 uh i was uh, 15 years old and I, I had been doing a in my high school peak in high school uh, we had a you could take a radio class and they actually had a studio a state-of-the-art studio in the school which Looking back on it now, it's almost unbelievable, you know, for a small town like that in, in 1963. Uh, and we did an actual radio show, a 10 minute show every day uh, during lunch hour, I think. Uh, that was, uh, uh, her, we, we did it over uh, telephone wires to the local radio station, you know. Oh, wow. So we didn't have a transmitter, obviously, but we had everything else. We had the board and the tape recorders and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, I was taking that radio a class and um uh, and then one day i got a call from the big radio station across the river in peoria wirl and long story short they offered me a, a job and that's where i started in radio and and i had always done uh like cartoon voices and things uh, my mom tells me that um from as long as she can remember after i started talking i was imitating cartoon voices and and then later on, uh, celebrities and things like that, you know. So when I started doing the radio show, I, I incorporated voices and, and little characters I made up into my show. And, and I always did that in radio. And I was in radio for 40 years, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and then, then, of course, when, when I got to New York, where, you know, the majority of all the network commercials are done, New York and L.A., uh, then I started getting jobs doing doing the voices on commercials. So, so I've always done the voices in just different venues, you know, yeah. but that's how I got started in, in the business. Yeah. That's very cool. That's very cool. And you kind of mentioned yeah. some of the commercials. What were some of like the earliest commercial roles that you took on? Is there anything that we would know? Some of the earliest ones. Well, the earliest commercials I did would have been, you know, when I first started in radio back in 63, because you, you had a lot of times read live commercials on the air. Right. And then, 
in the, in the smaller markets uh, like Peoria and the smaller uh, radio stations, generally the disc jockey staff, either before or after your own show, you'd go in the production studio and record whatever the program director wanted you to record for the, you know, like commercials that would run on other people's shows too. We all did that. And looking back, <coughs> pardon me. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Dan. Uh, uh, of course, at the time, you know, it was kind of a pain in the butt because what you lived for was to be on the air live, right. you know, and then to get off the air and have to go, I got to go and record these commercials. Now, but looking <laughs> back on it, man, it was great, great experience. It was, it was where I learned the business. And, um, and you didn't get paid extra for it back then. It was part of your salary, you know. Oh, yeah. But then when I got to, yeah. And then I moved up to bigger cities, uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, and then Cleveland, Chicago, and then finally New York. And, um, <clears throat> And of course, that's when I started really doing that. But you asked me, the, um, <clears throat> what were some of the earliest commercials? Uh, you're talking about like on TV. The yeah, TV. like television commercials. Because I yeah. know, I mean, we, we still hear your voice today on television. Yeah, commercials. yeah, so, yeah. Um, you know, I think I about like, no, I, go ahead, say, I think about like the, you know, the Skittles commercials. I remember yeah. when those Skittles commercials first started and like, I picked your voice out immediately, you know? And oh, you it's, did? It's, yeah. It's amazing. Cause it's like, really? I know that voice, right? I know that wow. voice. Is that, that's lion yeah. <laughs> telling me to taste yeah. the rainbow. That's amazing. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, it's funny you should say that because I guess all of all the different voices I do, uh, I used to be surprised when people say they recognize my voice on the Skittles commercials. Cause you know, it's great. It's a lot different. It's like, Feel the rainbow, taste the rainbow, you know? Yeah. yeah. But then, and I kept wondering, like people would come up at Comic-Con and say, you, you were, you're the guy on Skittles, aren't you? And I said, yeah. And you don't get used to that in this business because in commercials, there are no credits on the screen, you know? Right. Of course, now with the advent of the internet and uh, uh, you can find out who's any voice is, you know, you just type in who's the, who's the voice, you know, on the commercial for this or that. Uh -huh. But back then, nobody nobody would know who did the commercials, you know. Um, of course, with uh, with animated series, cartoon shows and stuff, you get credits at the end. This is, you know, lion played by Larry Kenny and stuff like that. So, but then I began to realize after I started getting a lot of people saying, uh, I, I, I knew that was you. Uh, finally, one of them, I said, how, how could you tell that? I liked it. They said, because it's the same voice you did on VH1 on uh, Best Week Ever. Oh, man, totally. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, had, I hadn't even thought about that. It's, for those of you who don't remember, it was back in the 90s, uh, uh, into the 2000s, too. Um, uh, a show a lot like The Soup or any of those things where there were outtakes from shows, um, movies, TV shows, things like that. Uh, and then we would make fun of them, you know. But I, anyway, I used that voice. Like the show started uh, with me saying, it's the third week of September, 1995. The best week ever. So that, that kind of became, feel the rainbow, taste the rainbow. <laughs> oh, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. So when you're, when you're preparing for like a voice acting job, like is there a method you have for coming up with the different voices or, and deciding how the character is supposed to sound? Well, you, you tend to... Uh, you know, you, you work with the, the client or usually the director, the producer of the commercial. Uh, most of the time, they'll tell you that we're looking for this kind of a thing. Uh, and then, or, or did you have something else in mind? You know, so it's a kind of a, it's kind of a joint effort. Yeah. Um, and, and, but then a lot of times too, it's, they, they tell you exactly what they want. And you just try to get as close to that as you can. For example, uh, when I first started doing, um, Cocoa Puffs, uh, no, I was actually, yeah, Cocoa Puffs first before Count Dracula. Uh, in 1978, uh, at the audition, um, they said, now we don't want any new voices on this. A guy named, um, for, yeah, for Sonny, uh, um, Chuck McCann had been doing uh, the Cocoa Puffs commercials for years and years. Probably when I was a kid, I was listening to him do that, you know. And so they, they played that for us and said, whoever can copy that, come as close to that, that's who will get the job as the new Sonny. In other words, don't come up with a new voice for it. And it was the same thing for Count Chocula. Uh, George, um, Jim Dukas had been doing it for years and years. So I guess I, I came closest to both those voices. And fortunately, 
you know, got those, those jobs. And I've been doing both those for uh, 39 and 40 years now. I've been. Wow. That's awesome. And that, for, uh, yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, that's, and I was going to ask you. Designer. I was going to ask you that exact question too. Yeah. Like in, when you take yeah. on a role where there was already a previous voice. So yeah, that most yeah. of the time yeah. you're just going to try to get as close as you can to what was already there with it. Yeah. That's because it's really established. Cool. It's already, it's established. The characters have been established for 25 years. So why change it? You know, unless, unless right. they want to change the entire uh, overall theme of the commercials and they didn't, they wanted to keep what the kids knew already, you know? Right, right. So when you step into the role of the main character on a new children's program, like Thundercats. So how does how does that whole thing work? Like, did they did they bring you in because you had the voice that they thought about for a character like <clears throat> Lionel? Or did you try a couple different things out? Well, uh, there are times uh, for commercials and of course cartoon shows where you're hired because they like, I mean, they, somebody has heard you and say, hey, let's use him. Right. Or at least let's bring him in for the, for the audition. Uh, I don't think so on the Coco Plus and Count Chocula. They just, they just brought in like every actor in New York and LA, at, you know, over a period of months and, and auditioned everybody. Not every actor, but you know what I mean? People who did voices and things like that. Sure, of course. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, you asked me about how you got the voice. Well, you get to the audition, uh, and for that audition, I, I, I got. Uh, first of all, let me go back a little bit for people who don't know. In this business, uh, voiceover business, you have to have an agent, and um, your agent will call you each day and say, "Okay, tomorrow, here's what you're doing. You go to this place at nine o'clock in the morning, and you record these commercials. Then you go to an audition at this place, you know, and then you, uh, you know, they, they give you your schedule." So when I got to the Thundercats audition, they had the whole walls were all lined with uh, uh, illustrations, you know, uh, drawings of what the characters looked like, what the what the uh, show was going to look like, Cat's Lair and the tank, the Thunder Tank, and all that kind of stuff. Oh, awesome! And then they told us, um, they said to me, uh, "We want you to audition for one Thundercat and one mutant." <laughs> If you remember the show, there were Mumra and his his evil people were, were the mutants. Uh -huh. Now, for for Lionel, they, they, then they said, which ones would you like to read for? And I said, well, I'm going to read for Lionel. But he's the boss, and he's the Lord of the Thundercats. I might as well try for that. And then uh, uh, I picked Jackalman. But for Lionel, uh, they told us we don't want cartoon voices, quote cartoon voices for the Thundercats. They are, after all, half human. Uh, uh, so we want them. We want them to have real voices, you know, uh, human voices, which was lucky for me because my voice was. When you hear Lionel, that's really just my basic voice that I'm using right now, but it's a little more dramatic. You know, if I'm sitting here talking to you now, I say um, "Sword of Omens" come to my hand. I Lionel command it, but of course on TV it comes off "Sword of Omens come to my hand." I Lionel command it. A little more <laughs> dramatic, but it's the same voice basically. You know. And then yeah. for, for a jackal man, one of the, who's one of the mutants, that's where you you get to really go all. Any actor will tell you they love to play villains because you get to really emote, you get to chew the scenery we call it, you know, uh, and just go crazy, you know. So they're a lot of fun. So I looked at jackal man. I said, let's see, a, what is a jackal after all? It's it's a you think of it at least as a really wily, snarling animal, you know, sneaky like a like a wolf or something like that and then as i'm looking at the picture before i went in the booth uh something popped into my mind for this character it was a character from rocky and bullwinkle which was one of my favorite cartoon shows growing up i don't know if you're familiar with it um but there was a character named snidely whiplash who yeah. was the, the the ultimate villain in cartoons he wore the stovepipe hat and and had a big mustache, you know, in the black cape. And, uh, and he'd say, uh, I'm going to get you, Nell, and tie you to the railroad tracks. <laughs> and all of a sudden, that voice popped into my head. I kind of combined it with the sneakiness and everything. And it came out, we must get the Thundercats, yes? And that was Jackal Man. <laughs> that is amazing. No, I love that. I love the process there of how you're coming up yeah. with the different voices. And yeah. And it's, it's amazing too, like, you know, all these years later, like mm. some of those voices are so iconic, especially to so many of us that grew up with it. So sure. I, I've always, you know, I've always heard 
from various voice actors and, and people that have worked on these cartoons and these toys, you know, like it was fun doing it, but you know, it was kind of like a job back then. And a lot of folks didn't imagine that 20 years later, 30 years later, we'd still be talking about it. Is that kind of how you feel when you look back on it too? Oh yeah, of course. You know, people always ask me, did you know Thundercats was going to be a hit when you recorded it? I mean, you have no idea. We knew, uh, we meaning the other actors and the, the crew, you know, the engineers and the producers and everybody. Uh, after we had done a few of them, we, we started saying things like, this is a good show. This is it's written really well. The music is fantastic. Yes. Uh, that, that hard, heavy metal music, really, for the first time ever in a children's animated television show. And um, the animation was fantastic. So we knew amongst ourselves... This has got a chance, but in this business, you never know. You're gonna have the best actors, the best writers, everything. And if it doesn't have just that certain something that the public wants, it can pick up on, you know. But you never know what that is until it's been on the air for a while, and then you either, you know, they, they either buy more of them or they just, you know, cancel it and it, it's all over. But nobody could have imagined that 35, 40 years from now, I'd be sitting here talking to you, like you said, about about Thundercats, you know? Yeah, yeah. I will it's, tell you this. No, go ahead. No, I was, you continue. Okay, thanks. I, uh, I will tell you this. The moment that I knew Thundercats was gonna be really big or was really big already, a couple of weeks before Christmas in uh, probably 86, the show had been on for, that was 85 probably. The show had been on for several months. And I was shopping at Toys R Us Remember Toys R Us? Oh, I miss <laughs> Toys R Us. <laughs> Everybody does. Um, and I was Christmas shopping a couple weeks before Christmas. And the, the previous time I had been there, uh, when I walked to the hero, superhero section, you know, uh, there was one aisle for Thundercats and there was one for He-Man and yeah. one for, you know, Masters Universe and all the other ones. This time I, I walked in, immediately I saw three rows with shelves on both sides of all Thundercat stuff. Oh, and I said, cool. oh my God, this show, this show is big, you know? And a little funny story, if I may, that same day <laughs> I was walking down the aisles and there were two young boys, I think probably nine to 12, something like that. And they were, they were looking at the um, action figures. And one of them said, uh, I'm gonna get Pantro. He's the coolest one of them, you know? And I smiled. And they're talking to each other, not to me. I'm standing behind them. Yeah. And uh, the other one says, no, I'm going to get Tigra. I like Tigra. <laughs> well, I couldn't control myself. I said, hey, guys, why don't you get Lionel? He's the one who says, thunder, thunder, thundercats. Oh. And they looked at me like, mom. <laughs> it says perv, you know. <laughs> and and uh, so I just kind of. Okay, and I just kind of walked away, you know, feeling stupid that I even said anything like that, you know. Yeah. But just as I'm walking away, I heard one of them say to the other one, he didn't even sound like Lionel. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's amazing. It makes you wonder yeah. if, if either of those kids remember that today and if they're like, yeah. maybe one of them's watching this and they're finding out right now. <laughs> I've, I've, I've hoped for that for these last 35 years that someday somebody will come up to me at Comic-Con and say, do you remember two kids at Toys R Us in New York and you were, uh, I would, would love to amazing. know, you know, that was you. Oh my God. <laughs> I, Cause I, I was thinking to myself when he said that, I just kind of went <laughs> and I had walked away already. And uh, I just thought to myself, Oh man, kid, if you only knew. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <grabbing your pants. laughs> oh man, that is fantastic. What a cool I, story. I love that story. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So, you know, coming from somebody here who like, I'm, I'm a big toy collector, obviously mm. when you saw stuff like that in the store, did you ever, did you ever buy any merchandise of the characters that you played just to, just to have it? I, you know, I bought a couple of things. I think my kids were very young at the time, so they weren't in, you know, my kids yeah. were only about four and this, you know, something like that. Um, I think during, over the years, the first few years, I think I might've bought a few to give Christmas presents to my nieces and nephews and things like that. But I didn't have, uh, people always ask me, I bet, I bet you have a whole room full of, uh, no, I have maybe, uh, well, I have one of the big Lionos, you know, the more recent ones. Yeah. But I don't have boxes and boxes of, of uh, sure. 
action figures or you know what I, what I wish I really had kept. The last couple of taping sessions we did for both uh, for Thundercats and for Silverhawks and then Tiger Shark, all those shows we did for Rankin Bass, they would bring huge boxes of animation cells. Oh, like wow. 10,000 animation cells in them. And they say, take whatever you want, guys. We're just, we're just gonna throw them away. We have, they have no need for them anymore. Right, know? wow. And for the younger people listening, um, uh, who may not know, uh, cartoons <laughs> are made now by <laughs> CGI. The computer makes everything. Well, I mean, with the help of a human. But back then, every frame of that thing was hand drawn mm -hmm. on, a, on, a, on a transparent cell. You probably have seen over the years uh, um, stories from uh, tours of Disney World and stuff where they say, and here are the animators hard at work on Mickey Mouse's next cartoon. And you see them <laughs> drawing and flipping it back and forth. So anyway, I think I took two or three of those animation cells. And I have one left today. I think it's a jackal man. And uh, I see on the internet those things are selling for thousands of dollars a piece. Some of them are, especially Some depending on like you know how much of the character is shown and how like prominent it is. Yeah, exactly. some of those are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I wish I'd taken a box of those home, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you, I'm sure you've seen some of like the modern stuff that they're still releasing for Thundercats, right? And I would imagine oh, yeah. people bring that stuff to you to sign and everything. But uh, oh yeah, like uh, yeah. It's, it's a little relevant right now. So I want to bring it up. Did you see the big Thunder tank that uh, the company Super yes. 7 is getting ready to do? It's like uh, two and a half feet long, I think. Yeah, it's huge. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah, life size. There you go. <laughs> Isn't it's that amazing? Though? It was on... Oh, yes. Like that's it's... still today. Like there's still this fan yeah. demand for this merchandise and it's still yeah. going strong. Well, you know, yeah, it, it is incredible. And of course, the, the, the franchise has been helped along by uh, uh, Warner Brothers in 2011. They, they bought the rights to all the rank and best stuff. And um, we did a reboot in 2011. Oh, I loved that show, uh, too. Uh, uh, yeah, I did, too. I thought it was a really good series and, and I was really... I really thought it would it would go. Everything about it was great. The animation was well, it was anime. It wasn't animation, right? And I think that's what it, what uh, held it back with a lot of people. They wanted it to look exactly like the original, you know what I mean, and sound just like the original. But I, as I tell people, that's been done already. You know, what's the point of just remaking the same thing over and over? But I thought they did a great job with it. I played Claude as Lionel's father on that one. Yeah, I'm that was I, that was a cool movie. surprise. I remember watching that. So was that how'd that feel getting a chance to kind of come back and, and be Lionel's father for that show? Oh, well, you know, I was so honored for myself and for uh, my fellow cast members from the original show and for the fans of the original show, because it, it was it was done very lovingly. Uh, there were a lot of things in the 2011 Thundercats uh, that were little homage you know, little tip of the hats to the original cast. Right. I thought the fact that they hired me to do Claudus was a giant, uh, not not just because it was me, but I think a, 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 a recognition uh, that, that a lot of fans still love the original. We're going to give them a little something, you know. And um, we hired one of the cast members and all that. And so I was really, really happy that they, that they did that. Uh, and... And it, as it turned out, all everybody working on that new one in 2011, when I walked in the studios in, in uh, Hollywood, Burbank, actually, the Warner Brothers Ranch, they all came running over. They were all guys and, their, and women in their, you know, 30s, early 40s, <laughs> who course. had been fans of the, of the original. And it just made me feel like a king, you know. Oh, Mr. Kenny, this is your, you had the golden microphone. You know? <laughs> and then uh, when the first time anybody saw the, the very first episode of um, that 2011 Thundercats was in San Francisco at a, a Comic-Con. Oh, cool. And they flew me out there. Yeah. And I got to meet uh, Will Friedel, the new lion -O, and and... Um, uh, Miss Chiriki, uh, Emmanuel Chiriki, the, who played uh, uh, Chitara. They had uh, this enormous auditorium, seated like you know 3,000 people. And they, they showed the first episode in that arena that night. And 
we were all backstage, the, the actors and the people from uh, Warner Brothers and all that. We were backstage. We we're going to come out after the, after the um, presentation. And so we could hear during the running of the half hour, we, we could hear um, everything was kind of muffled because you're backstage, you know, but we can tell what's going on. And all of a sudden there come, there's this enormous roar and, and cheering from the crowd. And we're all going, and uh, one of the guys from Warner Brothers came over to me and he said, they just heard you do Thundercats Ho. Yes. And I recognized that it was, it was me. I was doing it as Claudius, you know, right? Because that's where I you know, got it from. From his dad, uh, and that I, I actually brought a tear to my eye. You know, I thought, "Wow, that's cool. That's, that's nice." You know, that's they amazing. remember me. Yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, that is that is yeah. amazing. I bet that was really was, cool. Great. It was really. Uh, it really touched me. Did you get a chance to work with the the new cast uh, at all, or like, did you with Will Fradel, for example, who took on the role of Lion O? Did was there any kind of conversation there on? On, on how to play the character or anything like that? No, no, I, as a matter of fact, the first part of your question, did I get to work with them? No, I, and I was really disappointed. They flew me all the way out to LA. I walked into the studio and it looked just like the way we used to record in New York, a, mm -hmm. a semicircle of uh, six microphones, you know, um, fairly close together. This was before COVID, of course. And um, so I just thought that's the way it would be with this new one. I walked in the studio and I, and I got there a little early on purpose. And I just was chatting with the, with the recording engineer and you know, trying to kill time until Will and the rest of them got there. But it turns out that they weren't scheduled to work that day. They, they just flew me out there to work alone on my lines. Oh, wow. Which is unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately, that's the way uh, things are done in the business these days. I don't know why. Yeah, uh, that was actually... I was going to bring that up because I imagine things have changed quite a bit just from like the seventies and the eighties to the way things are now. Cause I think that like you just said, that is pretty common, right? There's a lot of remote recording and stuff happening now too. Isn't there? Yeah. yeah. Of course. I don't think we'll ever get back to the thing of six people in a small booth, you know, you know, leaning in together to get part of the mic or anything like that because of COVID, you know? Right. But even before that, even before the COVID thing, as of about maybe 10, 12 years ago, I started, started seeing it happen is that when you got booked to do, in the old days, if you got booked to do, let's say a radio commercial that had like six or eight characters in it, you know, uh, you would all be in that studio together. Now, they'll, you go in and you're by yourself in a little booth. Uh, the other actor might be in California they, they, and, the, and the producers might be in Chicago. You're all in that, you know, in the book up, uh, what do they call that? I don't know. I can't keep track of all the tech, technology. Sure. But you're, I, I miss, and I've talked to other actors who say they really miss being there, looking at, standing next to the person that you're, you're acting with to, to get feedback from them. And it's part of acting is reacting to, to what that person does or, you know. And it took a while to get used to just being all alone in that booth all the time, you know. It's, I imagine that would be a little a little hard. Like, do you find that a little difficult when you don't have the the other actors to play off of, or when you you can't even hear their lines being read? Does that affect your performance? It does. It doesn't make it difficult, not for me anyway. But uh, I don't feel it difficult. It's just lonely, and it's it's just not as much fun as it should be. I think. Um, I mean, one of the reasons you become an actor, whether it's uh, on stage or in the movies or on a cartoon show is uh, aside from the money, of course, as a job, but uh, wow, I get to spend another day with uh, these fantastic actors, you know, that I've looked up some of my Earl Hammond who played Mumra. Uh, yeah. He was in the seventies when we did the show. So he had been around for, you know, I, I idolized some of these guys and, uh, and, and women, uh, Lynn Lipton, she had been a big star in commercials for years and years. Um, so I, I just, you know, it doesn't make it harder for me. It's just not as, as pleasant as it used to be. And I don't want to sound like, uh, you know, if I heard somebody saying that, I would probably go, oh, come on, you're making money, you know, stop bitching. I'm not bitching about it. I'm lamenting. Right. You know, lamenting the old days. When, of course. You know, you could work with uh, great people and then go have a drink afterwards, you know, or in some cases before, 
<laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, uh, let me ask you this kind of on the same line of, of thinking here or the same discussion. I know you've done some video game voice acting as well. I know you've done stuff for like the Red Dead Redemption franchise. Mm. How does that differ from like the commercials and the animation? Is that change the way you do things at all? Because I think they even did some some mocap stuff, right? For the video games. Yeah. Yeah, that was a real shock to me, because the if you're hired, I, I've done several uh, video games with, with just my voice, you know, where I appear as the guy on the radio or something like that. Right, Grand uh, Theft Auto, that's, right? That's, what? I think Grand Theft Auto, you were like the radio voice. Yes, yeah, Grand Theft Auto 4, I think it was. That's great. And then I did one called um, Adam Wake, something, Mafia 2, a bunch of those, and they're fun. But there, it was just like acting on a commercial. You know, you're in the booth, you record it, you know, and right. you go. Motion, motion capture or mocap uh, is something so incredible. Um, when you're on camera, you get you arrive at the set, which is a, an old uh, Grumman hangar out in Long Island. Uh, it's where they where they made some of the um, rockets that went into space. Wow! So what? Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, uh, Rockstar Games, who, who did um, uh, Red Dead Redemption 2, they bought this old uh, hangar. You know, it's like 100 feet high and, you know, 600 acres inside, something like that. So you walk in, and there are thousands of cameras on the ceiling, and the walls, and there are about 30 people on this one, all along one wall, sitting at computers. They each have their own little job to do, you know, but it, it's so different than anything else. When you arrive, they put you in this suit. Uh, it's like a, a, not latex, I don't think, but it's, it's a, a bl all black suit that has um, little patches all over it that are receptors that the computers can pick up movement and things like that. You understand? Yeah. You have a, a helmet on with a bar that comes up like this, down like this, and there's a camera in it and a bright light right in your eyes that's how you have to act like that with a big heavy boots on and you spend about a half an hour before you even go on the, on the set on the stage uh with a guy in another room where there are there, there's like a am I, am I getting too detailed on this i'm no sorry. this is super interesting no i love this <laughs> okay thank you yeah it, it interested me too uh you'll stand uh, underneath this arc of of cameras maybe a hundred cameras and the guy will say okay open your mouth as far as you can i'll smile bigger okay frown okay now I'll lift your left arm for like a half an hour you're doing that so that the computer is learning your movements wow yeah so it does that and then when it's time for you to go out on set you go out and if you look up on the monitors there are monitors all around the room you see your character live. They've already, I mean, you see yourself in the costume with the character's face on it. Oh, but if you wave, God. it waves back at you. You know what I mean? It's the craziest thing. It's actually <laughs> you you're seeing, but the computer has already added the clothing and the face of the character and the, and the other computers have matched it already to the movements of the character. It's just the craziest thing. The props are not there there are no walls there are no doors or anything like that uh there are just things that represent that you know two two by fours and one across the top that's the doorway yeah. but when you see it on the screen even even there you see this big you see saloon doors you know and and, and, a, and a bar and it's crazy uh there's one scene uh, my character's name is jb cripps uh-huh old curmud curmudgeonly old guy you know he's, he's, well she uh, she claimed to be royalty but she had a head the size of a pumpkin <laughs> hell of a woman so that was my character and and at one point it's set in the old west you know so at one point my character the script says Cripps hops on his horse <laughs> i think where's the horse the director says over there in the corner it was a uh, 50 gallon barrel you know like an oil barrel an oil drum yeah uh, with a with a tail hanging out, a little rope hanging out the back of it for a tail, and 
and a saddle on it. And, but again, if you looked up on the screen, there's a horse standing there and you see yourself getting up on, onto the barrel, but on the camera, you're sitting on a horse. It, it's, it's the craziest thing. That is amazing. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> it's oh, beyond wow. me <laughs> how they do that. that's amazing well um let's talk about like for anybody that's interested in like doing a career like this like because i asked for some questions and a lot of the questions i got back from oh. some of our audience was like related to like getting into the voice acting so if you have any advice or anything like that you'd like to share um i, I know specifically some folks had asked about um uh, preventing mm. yourself from going hoarse after doing a lot of recording and, and stuff like that. So if you have any advice you can give to anybody that's interested in doing a job like this. You know, uh, I get asked that a lot, of course, and um, I never quite know how to respond. I finally, finally came up with an answer. I, for years and years, I would simply say, take classes, you know, uh, find a place where they teach voiceover classes and all of that. Uh, but now with the internet and everything, you can go online and uh, send in auditions and, and things like that. So I'm not really sure, you know, what the best way to do it is anymore. I've been in the business for so long <laughs> that I don't know what's the best way today, you know, to get, to get involved. Those things online, I know I've heard some actors say, uh, don't tell people to get involved with that because it's a, it's a, like a, it's not a scam, but they're just doing it to make money off of you. You know, they'll charge you a lot of money for lessons oh. and then, or charge you money for this and, and that. But I, I, but I can't say that I know that for a fact. I don't, but I, I still say the best thing to do if you can is take classes. Um, now, if you're still in school, some people, young people ask me, how should I get prepared for this? You know, I'm still in high school. I say, great. Take all the speech courses you can, whether it's even, even debate, take uh, public speaking, uh, if your if your team needs a, a, a PA announcer at the football games, say I'll do it. Do that. Anything that's you know that gives you some experience at the craft, and um, then uh, uh, even even be in, be in plays. You know if you can. That's what I tell people who are, who still have the time to do that. You know in school, um, but otherwise, some some adult comes and asks me, how do you get in? to it, I just tell them, well, now with the internet, you know, you can Google voiceover classes, uh, whatever, if you live in um, Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, you know, Google voice acting classes in Birmingham, Alabama, and you'd be surprised, but it'll pop up a whole couple pages of taking voice acting classes, stuff like that. And there, of course, like anything else, there are gonna be some that are really good you know, and uh, and being given by uh, people who know what they're doing. There's some that are not. You just have to kind of pick and select. And what I tell them to look for is a course. They're usually a couple hours a night for maybe two nights a week for, let's say, three months, something like that, you know. Sure. But look for one that promises you that when you leave, the, the, the when you're finished with the, the course, the program, uh, that you will leave with a, uh, a CD, of about two and a half minutes that shows what you can, shows your range. You know, if you do character voices, give them a bunch of character voices and things like that. And the, the, the good places to learn are the places that guarantee you that when you leave, they will have helped you put together a professional, we used to call them demo reels, but we don't have reel right. or tape anymore. So a demo CD, you know, that's an important thing. And also if you take a, if you take a, uh, trying to find a class where um, they promise you that during the course of the program, with the months or either there or whatever, you will meet people from an advertising agency. They will have people come in who are other who are voice actors to answer questions. You know, you'll get to network with people while you're learning how to do it, so that when you leave that place, you've got your CD. This, you know, this is my demo. This is this is what I can do. Uh, and you're ready to start going out and either looking for an agent, which you'll need in the larger cities or in a smaller city. I guess you could take that around to places and say, would you like me to do commercials for you? You know, right. But I, I think taking lessons, taking classes is the best thing to do. I don't know how, I, otherwise, I don't know how you'd get involved in the business. I mean, you can't just walk into a, 
advertising agency and right. say, uh, hi, I'm a mechanic, but I'd like to be a voiceover guy. Give me a job. <laughs> Well, it's you like know. you said too, things have changed so much over the years, right? And just the way it all happens. But but I think that is still some great advice, right? Get, get some classes, get some training and yeah, yeah. that's great. That's great. Yeah. So at the beginning of the interview, we talked about missing conventions and everything, but things yeah. are kind of slowly starting to happen again. Mm. And uh, before we get out of here, I did want to make sure we plug that you've got some upcoming appearances, right? Yeah. So I got a I got a list here of some dates and I'll go ahead and read those off because it looks like maybe I better maybe I better take notes because I might not know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, it looks like there's a there's a virtual event coming up for Galaxy Con on February 14th. Yeah, uh, there is ICC Con in Nashville, Tennessee, April 16th through 18th. Mm -hmm. um, Pensacon in Pensacola, Florida, May 21st through May, uh, the 23rd. Yeah. And then there's UltraCon in West Palm Beach, Florida, August 28th through 29th. So mm -hmm. it's got to feel pretty cool getting to do some stuff again, right? Yeah. Well, they're warm places. That's what I... I <laughs> That's true. I, That's <laughs> true. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm really anxious to get back out there. Let me say this, though. I am scheduled for those things that you mentioned. Um, but my agent has made sure when he talks to these people that the, the deal is, if I have been vaccinated before, you know, before that i'm not going to go to any comic con before i've been vaccinated right uh, i'm 73 years old you know and i can't i can't take that that chance of being in crowds of, of people of course so yes I'm, I'm scheduled to be in nashville you mentioned um and i'm supposed to, i'm hoping to get the vaccinations uh vaccination within the next couple of weeks but i want to let everybody know that when they hear people like you say go see larry kenny at nashville in whatever month it is there's a chance I may not be there. They'll know. We'll make sure they know a few weeks before so they can, you know, uh, tell people that I won't be there. And I, I always, I was going to say, I always hate it when I, when I can't be when I've signed up to be at, that hasn't happened. I mean, if I say I'm going to be there, I'll be there. But I think people understand with what's going on now. Of course, you know, of course, uh, right. Things are still so up in the air and we don't really know. Yeah. And so yeah. I would absolutely encourage everybody to go to each of the websites for those various conventions mm -hmm. and look at what they've got going on for their COVID guidelines and just, yes. just know what to yeah. expect. Because exactly, like you said, yeah, it's, it's all still up in the air and hopefully one day we'll be able to just, you know, get back to <laughs> doing things yeah. a little more normal again, but it's going to be a different, I think it's going to be a different normal for a long time. I think I so you, too. I, I think know so what too. you mean though. It's just to get back to some semblance of normality. Right. Exactly. Well, there is a, a few other things that I wanted to make sure we plugged for you too, because with, oh, with there you. being no conventions and everything, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, there, there is still a cool way to, you can support Larry Kenny and some of the other voice actors uh, who are represented by Epic Entertainment. Like, I know there's the, you've got this cool little uh, lion yeah. brick figure that is autographed yeah. by you, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you got an autographed one. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, any, it looks like anybody can pick these up uh, online if you want to grab some cool swag for yourself, if you're not able to do conventions right now, like most of us. So I'll make sure I link to that in the video description. And then uh, there's also like the Epic box, which is basically like a box of convention swag. Uh, where you can get cool autographs like Larry Kenny's autograph. So I'll oh, link gosh. to that. Yeah, I'll link to that all in the video description below for Thank anybody you. that's interested. Yeah, it's a great way to support the voice actors like Larry who, you know, we, we don't have conventions to go to right now. So it's a great yeah, way to help right. support them. So. But I just realized something. What's that? Mine's not autographed. Yo, <laughs> you better. <laughs> I, I got screwed, man. <laughs> <laughs> This is all grass, not even on. <laughs> you better talk to somebody about that. I can't believe that that. <laughs> yours will be though. Well, yours is already. That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I got the autographed one, so yeah. it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, people are so um, inventive. And uh, like when, the, when this COVID thing came, oh, no more comic cons. Immediately people, the smart people in our, in our business started thinking, well, how else can we do this then? Right. Ah, we'll do zoom calls you can, you can pay for a zoom call with somebody or you can um uh order an autograph and then we'll send you an autograph like the galaxy con thing i'm doing um on valentine's day right next week from tomorrow uh-huh um the first hour is is uh, me and some other actors uh answering questions like this da, 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 da. and then the second hour is devoted to um uh doing one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls with people who have ordered it during the first hour or, or whatever. So 
it's it's a very clever way of, of getting us all back together again with the fans you know absolutely absolutely it's cool it's it's you know it's been weird obviously having everything shut down but at least we have the option to do things like like what we're doing right now like this interview like it's cool that we've got the option to do it all right hey larry so before we uh end yeah. things off today do you think i could bother you for one big thundercats ho for oh, us? of course of course you ready i'm ready <laughs> let's do it let's see if he still got it <clears throat> thunder thunder Thunder, Thundercats, ho! Yes, every time, man. I love it every time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Well, Larry, thank you so much for sitting down and having this conversation with me. It's been really fun. It's been my pleasure, Dan. You do a great job. You mean, I just felt like I was sitting talking to a friend. I like that. Awesome. I, thank you, man. Thank you. Guys, now, I hope you... It. I'll see yeah, you out there. I hope. Definitely. Definitely. We'll see you at a future convention. It'll happen. <laughs> and guys, thank you so much for watching. I will make sure again to link down in the video description if you want to check out any of that swag. Until next time, my friends.